That's why we have to have a release form for everybody who signs in that, that if they do get death or di dismembered, that uh, they knew that coming in. Hello there, everyone. It's episode 47 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Master Ken. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, but here on the show, I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak. Whistlekick, in case you didn't know, makes the world's best sparring gear and some great apparel and accessories, all of it for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of you returning fans. If you're not familiar with our products, you should check out everything we offer, like our amazing sweatpants, now available in black. These are probably the most comfortable sweatpants you'll ever wear, and we've had people buying second pairs just so they can take one off to wash them. You can learn more about our sweatpants and all of our other gear and apparel at whistlekick.com. All of our past show notes, episodes, over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're on the website, why don't you sign up for the newsletter? We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests. Now, let's move on to the episode. On episode 47, we're joined by Master Ken, the legendary founder of Ameridote and star of the hit show, Enter the Dojo. There's little that I can do to prepare you for this wonderful interview, so I'm just going to step back and let you listen. Master Ken, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Uh, thank you for having me. It's an absolute honor to have you here on the show. And I'm sure most of our listeners know who you are um, as, as the, the founder of Ameridote. But I'm sure there, there's a lot more to you than just what we get to see from your videos. So perhaps you could indulge us and tell us how you got started in the martial arts. Uh, well, it depends on your definition of when, uh, when that starts. I mean, technically, uh, I did my first groin grab on the doctor that took me out of the womb. Um, I, uh, I just remember feeling someone grab my ankle and pull me into this world and uh, looked up, thought he was threatening, uh, grabbed his groin and then uh, uh, tried to choke him with the umbilical cord um, until some other nurses pulled me off of him. So uh, I've, been, I've been fighting and doing you know, martial defense in some form since the day I was born. Wow, that's that's pretty incredible. Certainly, you're started. You're you're starting a lot earlier than most of us. We've had quite a few guests on the show that start at three or four or eight or nine, but here you are at seconds old. Yeah. Do you think that set the path for you into the world, getting started in in, in the martial realm so early? Yeah, I, I think it did. I think that uh, that was that was why it was necessary for me to get into to martial arts was to contain the uh, power and effectiveness that I obviously already had. And um, so, you know, then then it went to uh, studying various martial arts. You know, Ameridote is the best of all and the worst of none. We take the best parts of every other martial art in the world with none of the weaknesses. And uh, so obviously I had to study those other things. That's what people don't get. Um, uh, you know, they don't understand why I think every other style is bullish. Uh, it's because I've studied it. Um, I, I have taken Shotokan, you know, I have taken Kempo. I have taken uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, it, it just took me less and less time with each style to figure out that it was a bunch of crap. Um, Shotokan, I made it to Orange Belt before I realized that was bullish. Um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu got to about a purple belt before I realized that was a joke. Uh, got tired of rolling around on the ground with people. You know, I mean, there's more inappropriate touching in one class of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu than there is at a slumber party at Bill Cosby's house. And I get, uh, but got tired of all that. Um, there was the, uh, the only style I didn't really officially get a rank in is um, uh, Kung Fu. I could tell that was bullish from the parking lot. So I just, I drove up, I saw the sign, and then I drove away. So your your meter for detecting BS must be pretty good. How would you say you've been able to do that? Uh, well, you know, it's it's uh, comparing, um, comparing martial arts training with real life situations. You know, being out in the street, uh, I've worked as a uh, uh, conflict resoluter. Uh, for various uh, establishments, bars, you know, I've been what other people call a bouncer. Um, I've worked security jobs. Um, you know, I've been a uh, an exotic dancer. 
so I understand what it's like to be in violent environments um, where people are slapping and pulling at you and, and what you got to do to really get away versus what all these people teach you, uh, which is a bunch of unrealistic scenarios. Yeah, sure, sure. And, and certainly you've had the opportunity to cobble all of those together and create the world's, how is it you refer to it, the most effective? Yeah, the most it's, it's the most dangerous. It's the most dangerous, most dangerous part okay. in the world because uh, it's not a sport. A lot of other styles in order to teach them, you got to turn them into sports. Uh, but this is, this is not a sport. This is street lethal martial arts. Uh, virtually every move that we have in Ameridote can lead to death and or dismemberment. It's impressive. It's in the release. That's why we have to have a release form for everybody who signs in that, that if they do get death or d dismembered, that uh, they knew that coming in. Are you willing to share with us how frequently that happens? Uh, I'm not at liberty to, to, to say I have a, I had to sign a thing. Uh, I have a couple of lawyers that, that, that keep me from discussing such things. Fair enough. And that's exactly what I would have expected. Now, of course, that that's a great origin story. You took it back farther than anyone that's ever been on the show. And honestly, as the host, that's exactly what I would have expected from you. So thank you for, for honoring us with that. But here on Martial Arts Radio, we're all about stories. And I'm sure you have a thousand stories that would put our other guests to shame, but I'd like you to pick one and tell us your best martial arts story. Oh, gosh, there's so many. Um, best martial arts story. Uh, let's see. I remember uh, I remember the first time that I ever... I'll tell you what. I, I remember the first time that I ever advanced a student who wasn't ready. You know? Okay. A lot of, a lot of that happens in the martial arts world. You know, there's uh, selling belts, selling rank all the time. Sure. And... Uh, Student came in, I think he was testing for purple belt or something, and, uh, you know, he didn't know his stuff. He didn't know his stuff, but uh, he was close, only screwed up on a couple of things. His mother was very insistent that I, uh, that I pass him, so I did. And uh, next day, he uh, wears his purple belt to school, showing it off to everybody. Ends up walking up next to a couple of homeless guys meth heads it turned out and uh they beat the crap out of him you know took his belt away uh and just uh just foot stomped him put cigarettes out on him threw him in the dumpster uh and so i felt responsible you know because i'd given him the confidence too early and uh so i went to see him in the hospital and i saw him laying there all beat up and broken and that's when I demoted him. I, really? Yeah, I took him back down to Orange Belt to teach him a lesson. Uh, so that he understood the value of the rank. And, you know, a year later, once he got done with the physical therapy and the surgery and everything, he came back, you know, and he, he worked really hard. And he tested again for that purple belt. And how did it go that time? Oh, he failed. Really? Yeah, he couldn't do the moves. Was, better, better or worse than the first? Oh, time? way worse because the guys who had stomped him, he, he had his arms were all misshapen and his fingers didn't work anymore. But uh, but he put a lot of effort in. He put a lot of effort in, and uh, actually, he still currently uh, works for me uh, in the dojo. He's the janitor, um, so I still let him mop the floors and and whatnot. He's just not allowed to train, so he doesn't embarrass me. Sure. It's very noble of you. Quite the honor, I'm sure, for him. Yeah, well, it should be. And I think this is a good time for us to transition out for, of course, any of our listeners that may not be familiar with Master Ken and the Enter the Dojo show. You were probably listening to that first portion of the episode wondering what was actually going on. But now I'd like to welcome Mr. Matt Page to the show. How you doing? The I'm, I'm doing great, sir. How are you? I'm doing great. That was a lot of fun and something I've been looking forward to uh, from a while ago when we started talking about doing this. So yeah, I'm uh, glad we finally have able been able to line up the schedules. It's great. Yeah, yeah. That that was that was a good time, and uh, 
of course, I had to mute my microphone so I wasn't laughing over <laughs> your story. But um, you do a fantastic job, of course, on the spot and and holding in character. And uh, is is that the hardest part of your job? You know, uh, let's see. I would say uh, it depends on the situation. When I'm doing stuff live, um, it's easier, actually. Uh, when I'm improvising or doing stuff live, it's when we shoot the show the Enter the Dojo YouTube show that I have a hard time. Uh, partially because um, the other actors, whether it's Joe Conway who plays Todd Woodland, my assistant, he'll say some say or do some stuff sometimes that cracks me up. Or when we film a season of the show, uh, the other actors just kill me. They're so funny. And so that that's the time when I have a hardest time uh, staying in character. It must be a lot of fun even those moments when you, when you got somebody breaks yeah, it's, and you got to, and you got to reshoot. I mean, just the, the environment there, I'm sure must be a lot of fun for everyone. Oh yeah. And that's what works about the show. I mean, the fact that, uh, that we do all find a lot of the same things funny is what works about the show. If we're not cracking each other up, then we know something's wrong. So we spend, you know, whenever we, we shoot and we shoot the seasons very, very fast over just a few days, but whenever we do it, um, it's just, laughing all day that's great <laughs> <laughs> what what's what's better in your job than that certainly oh yeah it's awesome great so for for anyone that has watched the show they've got a quite a good idea of what you find funny and uh, but have probably very little idea about who you are as the actor behind master ken so i'd like to take it back and re-ask you those first two questions how did you get started in the martial arts? You know, I um, I was a pretty um, undisciplined teenager and uh, kind of, you know, acting out a bit, got in trouble in, in school here and there, just being a pain, had a smart mouth. And and um, sooner or later, my, uh, my smart mouth got me in trouble. I got into a couple of fights, lost those fights very badly because <laughs> <laughs> I had no, I had never been in a fight, you know, and, and um and so I told my mother I wanted to take boxing. And um, I knew there was a boxing uh, gym uh, in Lewiston, about 20 minutes from, from Turner, where I grew up. And uh, she said she couldn't find it. Now that I look back on it, I think that she didn't want me to box. I think that she was worried that I would get my head beat in. So she, um, she found a martial arts school. Um, it was a traditional Okinawan Kempo school. And... Uh, you, you you just mentioned two towns that I'm kind of... Are you from Maine, sir? I am. <laughs> I'm from Casco. No kidding. Yeah. That's awesome. I didn't even know that. That's wild. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, tra I I grew up in Turner, Maine, um, but, you know, outside of Lewiston, Auburn. And, yeah. yeah. I trained... My very first instructor was a gentleman named Rick Pelletier, who had Pelletier's Karate Do in, uh, in Green. Uh, he had his... his it really started in Lewiston, and then he built a school in, in Green, Maine, which is still there today. Uh, Sensei Pelletier was one of my favorites to watch as a teenager growing up on the tournament circuit. Oh, that's so awesome. That's great. That's so funny. That is so yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah. I'm, um, he's passed away now. I'm not sure. Yeah, you know. No, I do know that. Yeah. I was very, very sad to, to hear about that. And I'm still in contact with, um, uh, with some of the students who took over and, um, yeah, we were all really sad about that because he was such a wonderful uh, instructor, a wonderful man, and and really, uh, I credit him with setting the foundation and setting a very high standard for martial arts um, against which I would and would compare and continue to compare any of my experiences mm -hmm. in martial arts. He set such a high standard for respect, for uh, traditionalism, for... Um, for just do just doing good karate, good good martial arts, you know, um, focusing on the basics and the fundamentals and and um, the integrity of it all. It was uh, he 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 set the bar really high. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. And, uh, and all of his students were all of his students were always very good. So I'm sure. Oh yeah, they. You came away with that as well. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I actually, um, um, uh, for for a few years. Um, uh, was uh, was dating uh, Sadie Sadie Holm, who was one of his prize <laughs> students. Who um, uh, she had just like like I think I remember they they in in their house they had to start putting their her trophies in boxes because they couldn't find 
any more room for all the trophies she would go out and win like her and her and Ferdy and, and all those guys yeah. would go out and just, and they really loved, they really loved performing at tournaments. They did a great job. And, but they, at the same time, they were also very, very focused on what made uh, a traditional karate school traditional in terms of being connected to the lineage, you know, um, cause they only had three degrees of separation. There was, uh, Sensei Pelletier and then Marcus de Valentino and then Sensei Odo in Okinawa. And mm -hmm. so there was always a very direct lineage to, um, the origin of the art. And, um, they were always very, very strict on terminology, on, on etiquette. And that was stuff I all, I, I took with me and something I really needed. Um, as a teenager, I actually really needed that because I, I think that I was, uh, um, I think I could have gone down a different path if that hadn't become part of my life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny. Um, Sadie is a name that I haven't heard in quite a few years, but she and I came up through the tournament circuit together. So it would not surprise me if you and I were in the same place at the same time. That is blowing my mind. Years ago. My yeah. Mind. <laughs> Yeah, at some point, you know, off air, we'll have to compare notes. And, yeah, we should. <laughs> and I, I bet there's there's quite a few people that we know in common. <laughs> That's cool. See, I told you the stories bring out the best stuff on this. That show. is true. Who would have thought? <laughs> like, I really, to people listening, we didn't plan this. This is this, not this not a bit. You said Lewiston, my ears perked up, and then you said Turner, and I said, Nah, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a fun story. We got a great story from Master Ken, and thank God I would never have to train under him and, and be demoted. <laughs> but I'd love to hear a story from you. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, since we're on that topic of, uh, of what, you know, what my initial experiences were, um, the story that I, that I have told here and there, uh, uh, and maybe I can, you know, I have told the story before, so maybe I can think of another one. But one of the things that's most relevant to the show is uh, my some of my first experiences leaving the dojo because I only knew a traditional Okinawan school. And so then I moved to California to try to be in the entertainment business and figured I would just find a dojo. And so I went to one in Orange County um, that had a name. Uh, I, it was like a, it wasn't a style I had ever heard of. Cause it was one of those ones that the instructor basically kind of just made up from their own experiences and then, you know, made up a style. Um, sure, sure. and they had, they really did have something that we spoofed on the show called groin sparring where they, <laughs> where they said they genuinely with no sense of irony said that the only target that mattered in a street fight was the groin. And so that was the only target they were interested in. They weren't encouraging you to kick and punch unless it was just a fake so that you could go for the groin. And then they, honest to God, my first fight, they made me fight a woman. And I remember thinking, well, this doesn't really seem that fair. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, A, why would I be fighting her? B, she's like the only person in the room who doesn't have the target that I'm supposed to go for. Right. And, and it was so bizarre. And they did a bunch of things. They made me... Um, stand on a balance beam they had a little uh just a, just like a foot off the ground but they made me stand on a balance beam and read um from like uh some martial arts book it was like it was uh zen in the martial arts or it was one of, or it was dao ji kung do something like that i had to st stand there um and balance on a balance beam and read that book while all while the whole class sat around and watched me and i was like i I'm sure there's a lesson here, but I don't really get what it is. It was, uh, it was such a bizarre experience that, uh, that was where the very, very, and this was a long time. This was like, you know, like 15 years before I came up with the official idea for the show, but I went around to these other dojos over the years. And I, every time I ended up in a very Americanized school, a franchise school, what a lot of people call McDojos that I didn't even know existed, um, I would have these bizarre experiences and kind of just file them away in my mind thinking, someday I'm going to do something about this. Someday I'm going to do a story so that references this in some way. Wow. That's fantastic. My mind's blown <laughs> that, that 
<laughs> Ameridote actually has some real roots in life. Yeah. That there's a school. Now, that's the thing. Uh, some of the weirdest stuff we do on the show is totally from real life. E either something that I have personally experienced or something that other people uh, have told me a story of a real life experience and have been like, that's going in the show. That's got to be. And, and it makes sense, too, when you think about it, because unlike a lot of other professions, um, there isn't really a lot of standardization in the world of martial arts. Like you can just you can get training anywhere or even not be trained and put on a black belt and say that you're a karate master and you can open up a school. And there's really not a lot of ways to uh, to limit or challenge or or test that. And so there's all these like bizarre versions of schools out there that people study and think, oh, well, this is martial art. This, this must be what it is. And, and so it leads to all these incredible experiences that people can totally relate to. <laughs> can I put you on the spot for another great example like that? Sure. That, that came into the show? Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. What am I thinking? I'll, 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 let me think about another one. Um, <sighs> trying to think of like a, one I haven't told before. Um, Well, there's the, there's the, uh, like the invention of the kill face, um, that, that came from a real pep talk. And this is the other thing that I tell people, you know, when I tell these stories is that like some of these really bizarre stories come from people who are martial artists that I genuinely respect. Um, it's just the longer you're in this world, the better, the better, the more sense there is of. Like there's just there are there are ironic and bizarre things that happen even if you run a good school even if you're like, you know the real thing. Yeah. Um, so anyway, this guy that I know um, was telling you that your that your face was the most important part of a fight because it was about your attitude. He was talking about the way your opponent perceives you, and he said you got to get you a face. He said get you a face that you when you put on that face, people don't want to fight you anymore. They're like you make this face that's so scary that you psych them out before you even end up in the fight. And, and I totally, and it's a legitimate thing. Like, I mean, I could see that I can, this, this guy in particular, um, his name is Kevin Bankins. He's a good friend of mine. Um, and he's trained me, trained me before in jujitsu and kickboxing. He's a great martial artist. But when he told me that, and he gave me that face, I got a little scared. He's a scary dude. But I thought, what if it went one step further and the face itself was like a lethal weapon? And so that was where the idea for the kill face came about. The idea that there was just a face you could make that could kill somebody without even getting in a fight. So that, you know, that's the kind of stuff that we come up with. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up a good point that for a lot of us, you know, who've been in the martial arts for a long time, that we sometimes have a hard time stepping out of it and realizing that a lot of what we do, even the effective, legitimate stuff is kind of silly at times. Yeah, and we don't mean for it to be, but the, the 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 trickiness of it again, you know, it's stuff that a is not standardized. Like most martial arts, don't have a lot of um, like in the kempo world. I spent most of my life in the kempo world, and in the kempo world, um, there's a lot of discussion going on right now that in American kempo there are an insane number of tenth degree black belts. Mm -hmm. There's like hundreds of them all over the world, and some of the lineages are unclear, and they're very young. 10th degree black belts they're not like in their 60s and 70s they're like and some of them are in like their late 30s and they're already a 10th degree and and it's be, again because of a lack of standardization um but even but even just trying to do this uh do martial arts as a as a sport or trying to make it more realistic for the street which is also a, a really funny conversation to have because there's so many problems with that yeah you end up doing these bizarre things that uh that are unintentionally funny. So we just keep, and every time we do a season, we think, okay, that's probably, we're probably out of ideas now. And then I'll go train, <laughs> I'll, I'll go train and I'll meet some other martial artists or I'll go to a seminar and be like, no, nope, there's so much more material. There's so many things we haven't even touched on yet. Do you ever find yourself seeking out sources of material in, in in, let me ask it a different way. Do you ever find yourself going to train with people that you are pretty sure will give you ridiculous things? Yeah, and I feel a little guilty about that. Okay. <laughs> I, I do. Oh, I, I, because I do like legitimately training. 
But then there are other times where I'll go to a seminar and think, this is going to be good. There's going to be something here that is going to be wild that I'm totally going to be able to use. And the people who know, know me and know that know the show, they'll say something accidentally ridiculous. And then they'll look over at me and they'll be like, don't use that. Don't do that. And I'm like, I can't help it. I can't, you, you know, the deal. if I'm in the room and you say something wild, it may end up on the show. <laughs> You're 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 possibly the first hipster martial artist training ironically yeah. <laughs> at times. Well, and that and you know that's another thing that um, that we tend to uh, that Joe and I tend to talk about a lot is the fact that part of the importance in the season of the of the character Anthony, who's the orange belt, is um, he's really the Matt Page character. Like he's the guy that I'm the most. Like I personally am not very much like Master Ken. I'm more the skeptical lower belt who's kind of watching things and being like, "Why do you say that? That's kind of weird." Or looking at a move, or looking at a move and being like, "Well, that wouldn't work," you know. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm like that kind of pain in the ass student that like is kind of annoying to guys like Master Ken. Um, and and but that character is so important to the show because he is really. He's the one that can look into the camera and he's looking right at the audience saying, this is weird. I, I, I'm with you. I, I get what you're, you know, he's the only, he's like one of the only characters on the show that's self-aware. Mm. Self-aware enough to look at the audience and be like, no, no, you're, I'm with, I'm with you guys. This is totally weird. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So. One of the things that we talk about on the show is competition and how that's a thread for a lot of the martial artists that we talk to. Did you ever spend any time in competition? Possibly side by side with me? <laughs> right. Uh, you know, very limited. Um, very limited. I I tried a few tournaments and um, I think I picked up, a. I think I, I did okay in kata. I think I usually managed to like place somewhere in the top three or four for, for kata, but um I was never, I don't know, I, I, I think that my motivation for so long with the martial arts was always that I was fascinated with martial arts movies. So I just wanted to learn how to do the stuff I saw in the movies, and everything else was kind of secondary. Um, uh, you know, that, that, and, that, and I wanted, you know, after being beat up a few times in high school, I didn't want that to happen anymore. So I was like, well, I at least want to know the basics of how to defend myself. Um, but outside of that, it was more about how can I do what I see Jean-Claude Van Damme and Steven Seagal and Jeff Speakman and those guys, how, how can I move like them? I want to move like those guys. And so that was, that was my, my, uh, and then, and then when the UFC came out, it became, how can I do what I see Hoist Gracie doing? Um, mm -hmm. and, and so that, that, the, that always sort of motivated, um, my relationship with it. And very seldom did that lead me to, um. To tournaments um it just was never my thing and, and you're not the first person to say that you know it certainly takes a certain approach to the martial arts to find competition enjoyable yeah and i have um, immense respect for people who who measure themselves that way um constantly you know i think that that's that's one of the best ways because it's puts you under a lot of pressure you know it's scary to have people watching you it's scary to test yourself um uh, whether it's being on the floor doing a form or whether it's going out and fighting in competition uh, to test yourself against somebody you don't know. Um, I have I have immense respect for people who do that. Now, I, I do have to say I find it a little bit ironic that here you weren't gravitating towards being out in front of everyone performing, Yeah, which is how some people <laughs> look at a competition, and then you pursued a career in entertainment and ultimately you are performing in front of a much bigger audience. Right. I guess, yeah, I guess my, I guess I always felt more comfortable, um, performing as a, as a character, you know, like, I, like I, if I have a, if I'm playing somebody else, then I get a lot of satisfaction out of it. If I'm in a play or if I'm up, you know, pretending to be, uh, to, you know, up, up being master Ken or acting in a film or a television show, then I can, I feel like I can sort of separate myself and say, well, this is something different. This isn't me. You know, this is, uh, and I also, quite honestly, I think I'm, um, from my experience, I am an incredibly average martial artist, like perhaps even, perhaps even a, a little below average. And yet, um, I was always drawn to the arts and always getting a really 
great response to my writing, uh, my sketching, my acting. Um, as an artist, I always got a lot of positive feedback. As a martial artist, particularly when I would spar and kind of get beat around, like I could survive, but I was never an exceptional um, martial artist. So I think that I kind of just gravitated towards what it seemed I was, uh, I had some, some talent for. That's pretty profound statement. I mean, we don't have a lot of people in our world that are that aware of their skill and that open with their own self-assessment. I mean, would you be willing to talk about that for a minute? Yeah. Yeah. No, sure. I just, you know, I really, I, from, you know, I, I feel like it's easy to, um, to fantasize for quite a long time about being good at and being good at martial arts in in a competitive situation and also in quote the street you know like some some scenario where you execute all the perfect moves and protect your loved ones and 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 you know knock some bad guys down or whatever that is which i think just about anybody who studied martial arts has that fantasy in their mind right um yeah but then the longer you live life and the longer you see how real violence happens and, uh, you know, I, I became more and more skeptical of that scenario. Um, even just the fact that human beings are a lot more uh, complicated than being the good guy and the bad guy um, and that real violence is very, very sloppy and very unpredictable. Um, I do think it is good to have some basic training so that you're not a victim. I definitely think that training is good. Um but I just, I also looked at myself in competitive situations and I would, you know, I, uh, jujitsu was the only thing that I was ever decent enough at where I could, um, really survive against somebody who was maybe a little bigger, faster, or stronger than me. Um, striking, I was always was kind of a mess. I was never a particularly talented striker. Now I'm always getting hit a lot and never really figuring out why. Um, and so I think that was why I, I, I eventually did gravitate toward uh, the, the ground fighting stuff. Cause I thought, well, at least I'll be able to stop them from punching me in the face. Um, and, and, uh, that was the fascination over the years with, uh, with arts like that. But, but yeah, be, being self-aware like that over time, like starting to figure out, um, also where I wanted to put my effort. You know, I found myself putting a ton of time into, um, being a martial artist. And I definitely think that's, that's great. Um, but in my 30s, I had, I had to start to say, gosh, you know, it seems like I don't seems like I'm not reaching a lot of my goals. And I had to look at how I was spending my time and say, if what do I want to succeed at the most? Do I want martial arts to be a way of life or does it have to start being a hobby so that I can succeed in other areas? You know, well, for sure. And, and I think that's an important part of maturity. I mean, of course, through Whistlekick, there are 10 million things that I should want to be doing every day <laughs> that aren't going to happen, you know? So it's about prioritiz prioritization and you've certainly done that. And, you know, I'm going to guess that as you did that, you saw increased success with the show and, and with what you're doing with the enter entertainment side of your life. Yeah. I mean, it, it, Acting and filmmaking has always been my highest that, – that's been, that's been my highest priority. And once I really started to say, okay, well, more than anything else, I want to succeed as an actor and as a filmmaker. That's, that's my number one thing. And then martial arts can be the third thing. But it can't be – I can't have them all on the same level. And once I started doing that, I, I, at the same time, I had the idea of like, well, but I have a background in this. So there's a level of authenticity um, that when we do episodes of the show – people who study martial arts are like, oh, that's a real thing. That's really the way the martial arts world works. And so it did help. It did help that I had a background in it. It does help that Joe Conway owns a working dojo where we film and that he and I do train and that he teaches every day and that we're still connected to that world. Um, it's just that, you know, it is, it, it, to answer your question, yes, I've absolutely saw a dramatic increase over a few years of uh, once I was really focused on on entertaining people with martial arts as a, uh, from a comical point of view, that clicked. Um, I don't think that me being a straight up, uh, if I had tried to approach it as me being a straight up 
action star like Steven Seagal or Jean-Claude Van Damme, I don't think any of that would have worked. I think it was always going to have to be a comedy. Fair enough. And it's not my um, acronym, but I'll share it with you and with the listeners. Uh, I really like this focus, follow one course until successful. Absolutely. That's a great, that, that, that uh, holds more and more true. I'm actually typing that down now. Uh. <laughs> Good, good. Don't don't give me credit for it. Uh, I didn't come up with it. Just I heard it on another podcast. Yeah, no, but it's very true. It's very true, and it's something that I think that uh, in my twenties I wanted to succeed at absolutely everything, and I would uh, find that you know I wasn't really making as much headway as I wanted to in any particular area. And then once I was able to streamline it and say, okay, well, what are the most important things to me? That the more I reduce that number of things I'm focused on, the, the the happier I am, and the more successful those things are. And and so martial arts is still, you know, is still a third. It's still the third thing, um, but it had to take a back seat to uh, to the creative aspect because uh, that's that's my my number one focus. Well, I know there are quite a few people out there that are maybe would be a little sad to hear that that's what it, it took, but are quite pleased with the result selfishly I, I can say i certainly am yeah <laughs> well I, I get to watch the the show and see master ken and all the the wonderful things that you put out that maybe wouldn't have happened yeah well and i love you know and i love the fact that people do i am so flattered by the fact that people do really people want ken to be a real guy like they want they they want ken to be 100 percent real and that's both um troubling and, <laughs> and very flattering i i because Ultimately, Ken does still represent kind of what's wrong with Amer with American martial arts, but because he's fun to watch, um, people just want to know what he's going to say next. Um, so, so yeah, I, I do. And, and again, you know, I mean, the good thing about uh, about having that character is that it does keep me connected to martial arts every day. You know, I have to be reading about it. I have to be training. I have to be doing things so that I'm still plugged in so that we can come up with content for the show. Sure. So you've mentioned a couple actors as we've gone on, Van Damme, Seagal, Jeff Speakman. Is one of those your favorite or maybe somebody else? You know, um, uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme is probably, well, he is. Jean-Claude Van Damme is, the, is, I'm a huge fan of this. I, I grew up on his movies. I grew up on all those guys' movies. But Van Damme was the guy that um, I emulated the most, you know, I would like be in the basement in front of the mirror, trying to kick like him, trying to figure out how to, you know, get the, like, got, I got that, like that stretching machine, that real, that, that like just spread your legs apart, you know, yeah. that torture device, you know, because I, I had to be able to, to get as close to a split as possible. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, I was a huge fan. I, I owned and watched all of his movies. Um, that was also a Steven Seagal fan uh, of his early stuff. Um, I liked the perfect weapon and was excited when I finally got to meet and train with Jeff Speakman. Um, and uh, yeah, I followed all that stuff. I, I, it was, and it was hugely inspiring to me. I wanted to, I wanted to be able to move like those guys. I wanted to be in movies like those guys. And, uh, they sort of, you know, I, I, and it was weird actually going to film school and like not knowing a lot of the filmmakers that, that I should have known by then, like Orson Welles and those guys, but I knew every word and every shot and every frame of every Jean-Claude Van Damme movie <laughs> because I had watched them until the VHS. Remember the VHS tapes would actually yes. start to get so worn that the, uh, the auto tracking couldn't even fix it anymore. <laughs> right. Get those weird lines all over the tape because you've watched it so many times. And uh, I would have actually have the, uh, the tapes queued up to, to my favorite fight scenes so that if I just wanted to watch like just a fight scene before I went to school in the morning, I could just pop in the VHS and it was cued right to that scene. And, and so I would wear out the middle of the tape by watching the same fight scene like 200 times. Um, do, you, do you have a favorite fight scene from one of those movies that we can plug in the show notes? You know, one of the things, let's see, I, I would say, uh, let's see, it depends on the movie. So for Jean-Claude Van Damme, my favorite one, my favorite movie still that I would love, we keep talking about spoofing this with Master Ken, but like um, Double Impact, where he played twins. Um, yeah, I remember that. Even though he's played twins three times. Uh, he's played, he played <laughs> twins briefly in Maximum Risk, and then he played them again in The Replicant. I mean, a clone, but a twin in that. Right. Um, but Double Impact was the best of the twin movies that I think he did. And uh, when he fights Bolo Young, 
you know um i mean he he did a great I, the, the second favorite is the van is the is the fight in blood sport and it's still that's a really much more elaborate fight but the way that uh sheldon Ledich, uh uh i think that was sheldon Ledich that directed that one um uh the way that was shot and lit and everything and all the action like i used to keep that fight specifically queued up because that one was was one of my favorites but every every scene Every every one of those movies, I had that queued up. You know, for Hard to Kill, it was when Steven Seagal goes into the uh, convenience store in like the first ten minutes of the movie, um, and uh, those guys come in to rob the place, and he beats them all to death. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, which looking back, it's like that's pretty extreme. He really, he really, uh, <laughs> he does. He's so brutal in those movies. You know, he's like kind of uh, a bad guy himself, almost in how brutally violent he is in all those movies. But that was what was fun about it. In Out for Justice, it was the bar scene. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when he goes back looking for Richie, and he ends up beating everybody to death with a with a a, 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 a cue ball and a handkerchief. Yeah, you know, like all those movies. I can brutal. I can think of each one of those movies. I can be like, yep, yeah, it's that scene. You know, Lionheart. It's the big fight at the end. Um, and I would just keep all those cued and watch, just watch them over and over and over again, just studying how they moved, how they shot it. Um, I was just fascinated with it. And I still really like going back and watching those movies now. It always fills me with so much nostalgia um, because it was such a particular time. It, they don't make action movies like that anymore because what they used to do, like they don't really do this now. They used to cast people based on their martial arts ability, not on their acting ability. And now they put martial arts movie, they put, they put movie stars who may have a little bit of experience or none at all. They train them for a few months, put them in harnesses, and now they're super duper martial artists. And a lot of the, a lot of what they do, and it's great. Some of them do great work, but a lot of it is, has to do with the editing and has to do with the, the special effects and whatnot. Whereas before, I mean, Van Damme, you know, he's there doing that helicopter kick as many takes as they need. Uh, and he's doing it for real and yeah. and jumping up and doing a helicopter kick and like just, you know, grazing the face of a stunt actor. Um, and, you know, when Steven Seagal was at, at his peak was doing Aikido, his Aikido was amazing. You know, I mean, you know, people have a lot of debate about his skill level now, but like uh, in his prime, uh, he was so fast and his technique was so great. And and then they would just build a whole movie around. It's like those dancing movies, right? It's like those movies that like feature really great dancers, not great actors, yeah. and they're just like, okay, we just got to get through like this next seven minutes of plot, and then there's another dance number. <laughs> and it's like, it's like so true. It's the same thing with martial arts movies. It's like, okay, we got to suffer through some pretty bad dialogue and pretty rough acting, but the cool but the cool chase scene is coming up in like seven minutes. So I'm gonna go to the kitchen and I'll just let the movie run. And I'll go to the kitchen. I'll make myself a sandwich. And by the time I come back, it's time for the chase scene. And that's the scene I really love or whatever, you know? So, so yeah, all of this, um, my whole relationship with martial arts as a martial artist and, as, as, and creating the show all comes from just being totally inspired by those guys and really loving that particular, that very odd period where American martial arts action movies were so peculiar because they don't make those movies anymore. No. And I don't know if they how well they would do if they were made, but I would certainly watch. Yeah, them. yeah, and they—that's the thing—you couldn't get away with it because the thing, the beauty of the of the eighties and early nineties was the, was the sincerity. Like you could you could say really bad dialogue, and you could have bad guys getting killed in certain ways, and you could have the the macho relationship, you know, with saving the damsel that led to the love scene and everything, with no sense of irony. Um, you could be totally sincere. You could have the really, what, what's that really bad, um, you know, in Bloodsport when Van Damme is running away from Forrest Whitaker and the other guy because they're trying to take him back before he finishes fighting in the Kumite. Right. There's that horrible 80s uh, theme song that's really playful and it like doesn't fit the movie at all. <laughs> it's a, like, and it doesn't make, and you watch it now and, you, and it's the same thing as the opening credit sequence of Kickboxer um, that Mark DeSalle did, it's like the music montage is so homoerotic and it, and it's unintentionally hilarious. You know, uh, um, uh, I actually showed some of my film friends um, showdown in little Tokyo um, a few years ago, you know, Brandon Lee and, and Dolph Lundgren. 
And that opening credit sequence, I had forgotten the opening credit sequence is just like a dude's arms and chest <laughs> with like tattoos. And it's supposed to be all ominous because he's got Yakuza tattoos. But they're watching the opening credit sequence of this dude like flexing in the dark. It's just this shadowy shot of like his pecs and his <laughs> biceps. And they're like, um, what, what are we watching again? <laughs> I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like in the nineties, this was like, this was really tough. This was like really cool and, and manly. Now, now, <laughs> now <laughs> if you made a movie like that, you could not do it sincerely without people laughing at you. But perhaps master Ken could, is, is there, I mean, I, I have no idea and hopefully I'm not spilling the beans on something and putting you on the spot, but is there talk of a, something longer more feature length yeah you know it's something we would absolutely love to do it's something that uh is we keep talking about it and uh, you know to be honest it's actually where some of the seasons come from because uh, we've been flirting with hollywood for a few years now i've gone out and done meetings and pitch meetings and i've pitched it as a show to comedy central i pitched it as a movie to paramount I i've pitched it all over the place and people really like it, but then they don't really know what to do with it because it's such an odd type of thing. You know what I mean? It's like, again, it's like it's spoofing a type of movie they don't make anymore. And uh, so I end up writing these pilot scripts and these movie scripts. And then it comes time to do another season of the web series. And I just end up stealing the material that I've written for the movie or the material that mm -hmm. I've written for the pilot and be like, OK, well, let's just use that for a season. And so then we shoot it all. And then I have to rewrite it again and be like, okay, I've used all that. Now I got to come up with another version of what Ken's life is like and what, what this story is. But I would love to do a movie. I would really, really love to do a master Ken movie. And initially we were thinking like that it would be about enter the dojo about the show. But I kind of more and more think like it would be way more fun to like put master Ken in like an 80s action movie, like put him in a double impact kind of twins kind of martial arts thing, like put him in some, just put him in those scenarios and just see what he does. Cause I think that would be so fun. I'm almost thinking, uh, you seen the movie Joe dirt with David Spade. Yeah. Yeah. Like a martial arts Joe dirt opening with, with, you know, what, Ken told us about his origin story, the trying to choke the the doctor out with the umbilical cord. Like I could totally see a movie starting with that scene, right? No, yeah. and I would be hooked. Absolutely, it would have. And and uh, and what we we what we joked about, um, uh, what, what some of us joked about has been the idea of like that if Ken did, if he did an autobiographical film, but he insisted in starring in it at every age. So he, he's like playing his six-year-old self, <laughs> like, like in totally implausible situations and like beating up little kids, showing how tough he was back then, um, you know, like all these and all these things that could not have possibly happened. Yeah, I, I, I think it will. I think it will eventually happen because um, every year. Um, awareness of the character grows every year. Exposure on on YouTube and on Facebook and, and uh, uh, people discovering the show and the live shows and everything, it gets bigger and better every year. Um, and so I, I think that, I think the character is going to be around for a while. Good. I hope so. So if people want to follow you, if they want to watch the show, learn more, where do we send them? Um, Let's see. Well, I mean, the easiest thing uh, is to Google Enter the Dojo or Master Ken, and that will sort of, some stuff will pop up. Um, uh, there is an official um, channel, obviously, youtube.com slash Enter the Dojo Show. There is um, the Facebook page, um, which is, I believe it's facebook.com slash Master American, K-E-N. Um, we technically have a Twitter page, but I suck at Twitter. Um, I just want to mention it because I, I'm, I've, I, I like Facebook because I can type really long um, updates. Um, I post too much content. I'm going to, we keep saying we're going to get the hang of Twitter. We've been saying that for three years. Um, so we probably won't. Um, but those are the, those are the primary places. And then um, if anybody's interested in, we also sell t-shirts and DVDs and stuff like that. And that's just at our regular website, enter the dojo show.com. Great. And we'll have all of that stuff available on the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, so people can go check that out and 
we'll make sure we get all that spread out. So, and any parting advice for everyone listening? Gosh, what kind of advice do people give on the show? Like what's what usually deep and heartfelt and <laughs> poignant. Yeah, uh, that's not our take the complete opposite direction if you're <laughs> so inclined. What would Master Cat offer excuse me for advice? Oh man, Ken Ken would have something uh something to say about making sure that you're, you know, super dangerous and you only train train for real and everything. I think that I think my personal advice would be that uh what I'm, what I, what I have the most uh, respect for um, are people who, who train to be, you know, martial artists who, who train uh, as a way of life, you know, not just as a fighter, um, but people who use martial arts for self improvement. I think, I think that there's a lot of focus today. I think that there are great athletes in MMA, and I think that all that stuff is great. But I think that um, the point. Of, of good martial arts training is still to develop you, you know, as a human being, develop you intellectually, develop you emotionally. And uh, I think if you're getting something out of that, then it's okay that you're not, um, you know, the toughest kid on the block as long as, uh, as long as it improves you as a human being. Thanks for listening to episode 47 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And thank you to Mr. Matt Page for his time. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes with links to everything we talked about today including links to all the social media for Master Ken, links to where you can watch Enter the Dojo, and a few other places to check out. We're also including my favorite Enter the Dojo clip titled 100 Ways to Attack the Groin. If you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the form on the website. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you can stay up on everything we do. If you like the show, please subscribe or download one of the apps so you never miss out in the future. And if we could trouble you to leave us a kind review wherever you download your podcasts, we'd appreciate it. Remember, if we read your review on the air, just contact us and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. Remember the great stuff we make at Whistlekick, like our comfortable sweatpants, over at Whistlekick.com. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.